Hello, this is Jack Jackson. This is uh, the start of our playlist for week eight in history of mathematics. And in this week, we're going to be talking about mathematics in Europe during the Renaissance period. Uh, as usual, my main sources are some of the lectures of my friend and colleague Todd Timmons, uh, the history of mathematics by Carl Boyer, history of mathematics and introduction by Victor Katz, the Mac Tudor History of Mathematics online resource that is excellent. So in this video, we're going to just kind of introduce the Renaissance period a little bit and give an introduction overview of some of the mathematics there. So the period we're talking about is the 15th and 16th centuries. So 1400s to 1500s. Uh, Boyer in his book suggests 1436 is the end of the medieval period and the start of the Renaissance period, at least for mathematics history, because it's the probable date of the death of Al-Kashi, a prominent Islamic mathematician at the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, and it's also the date of the birth of Regiomontus, an important European mathematician of the Renaissance. And so during this time we see a shift from the Islamic world being the center of mathematical growth to uh, Europe taking over that role. So around this time, mathematical growth began to decline in the Islamic world and began to accelerate in Europe. It's, it was a period of renewal and the start of more rapid growth in many intellectual ideas, including mathematics in Europe. There was a more interest in classical works, especially Greek. The Renaissance started in Italy where there was more trade with the Islamic world and beyond. And it accelerated after the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453. So the early to the mid 1400s is where the Renaissance really starts to take off. Scholars fleeing Constantinople and the collapsing Byzantine Empire brought ancient classical works, including Greek mathematical, scientific, and literary works to Central and Western Europe. Knowledge transfer from the Islamic world to Europe began in the later medieval period, especially in Spain and in Italy. <clears throat> However, it was accelerated in the Renaissance. Here's a map I found online of Renaissance Europe around 1450. So just take a look at a few things here. The Ottoman Empire had now expanded beyond Asia Minor to take Constantinople and uh, a big chunk of Eastern Europe here, including uh, the Grecian Peninsula here, uh, parts of uh, Bulgaria and so forth, and up here into Crimea, uh, most of the way around the Black Sea. And uh, what we would now call Italy was broken into several different groups. Uh, there, was, there was the uh, Papal States here centered at Rome and the, and the uh, the, the Vatican had control of a lot of that, the church. Uh, we, have, we have this part down here, Naples and Sicily, and different areas here. And up in this part here around Venice, we have some area up there around in Milan, Genoa. So each of these little uh, areas were had different controls and were essentially different countries uh, there in what we would now call Italy. Uh, during the Middle Ages, Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, in France had expanded his empire from starting in France, but moving out through a big chunk of Europe, and he declared himself the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, got the Pope to do that for him. And so from that time on, there was a group of leaders who considered themselves Holy Roman Empire emperors, uh, the heirs of the Roman Empire, although they really didn't have that much directly to do with with Roman Empire at all. And so there's this large area here that was at least theoretically under the control of the Holy Roman Emperor. This would include all of what's present day Germany and then beyond that. However, this wasn't a really strong central uh, empire at all. Actually, it was mostly a lot of more sort of independent states, which had some uh, independent uh, little uh, city-states which had some um, allegiance to the Holy Roman Emperor and different emperors had different levels of, of uh, control over that area. 
you can see Poland here, Lithuania, uh, much bigger than Lithuania is now, including uh, large portions here of, of Eastern Europe. Okay, yeah, a lot of lot of it, what's what's now Ukraine. Hungary is pretty big here. Um, England, uh, the British island here, uh, Great Britain. We have the separate kingdoms of Wales, England, and Scotland. Ireland is a different kingdom over here. And look down here in the Iberian Peninsula, we have Portugal, and we have the separate um, areas of Castile, Aragon, and Navarre. Now, at this time, Castile and Aragon, one of, one of those uh, regions was uh, led by Queen Isabella and the other one by King Ferdinand, and they married and combined those into what we now call Spain. And so here is Europe in 1500. Notice that now we have a more unified Spain, more or less the Spain that we know today. But Spain became a big naval uh, power at that time. Uh, as we know, this is this is uh, you know right about the time of uh, Columbus's voyages and other voyages of exploration, where Spain started really uh, expanding out from this area. Portugal also was a major uh, naval power at that time as well. So this is kind of the some of the political boundaries at about that time. But notice uh, uh, as part of that. What we saw here is the expansion of the Turkish Empire, Constantinople, which was uh, uh, this this area here with Greek, the Greece, the Greece and Peninsula, and most of this part here was the um, the the eastern part of the Roman Empire, right? The Byzantine Empire, and that fell to the Ottoman Turks. So this became under uh, Muslim control. And then folks leaving there uh, made their way. Scholars took some of the works there with them, both Christian works and in earlier works, Greek works and so forth, and came over this way. During this time, there was a lot of changes in the way people thought about things. There were some changes in religious thought. There were some changes in secular thought as well. Uh, um, there was sort of a general questioning of the status quo of current religious and secular thought. There's a general move toward questioning traditionally held beliefs. And that made people open to new ideas and also to a renewed interest in ancient knowledge. There arose something called humanism and a study of the humanities. So grammar, rhetoric, history, poetry, and moral philosophy were now being studied at the universities. Of course, the old quadrivium and the mathematics was still taught there as well, but it broadened considerably what was taught at the universities, and it uh, changed the way people thought about lots of things. There was a lot of return to sources, trying to return back to early Christian sources, trying to return back to uh, sources of Greek thought in particular, and other things as well. There was a move to educate the citizenry a little bit more, so so that uh, there was a more educated class, particularly maybe not the lowest class, but, but maybe a merchant class that got more education than in the past. There was more individual expression and thought. Among things that happened here were the Protestant Reformation. Uh, unfortunately, that caused uh, uh, many, many years of, uh, of violence in Europe between the Protestant group and the Catholic groups, uh, graphically group and various Protestant groups that were going on there. And so this uh, left some political turmoil in Europe as well, but it did open up a lot of different ideas of thought. And these things also affected the mathematical thought at the time, too. As I mentioned a little bit before, this is the start of a big age of naval exploration and expansion, the European discovery of the Western Hemisphere, the New World. Of course, you know, people here already knew about the Western Hemisphere before that, and the people who the natives had knew about that, and the Vikings had been here long before that, but the the Europeans uh, made this new discovery to them, and this. Uh, greatly affected the uh, colonization 
of various parts of the world, not only the Western Hemisphere, but also Africa and the Far East as well. Along with this came some expansions of uh, technolo technology driven by mathematics to do things such as map, map projection and navigation as well. And one of the biggest things was the invention of the printing press. There's it's really no way to, to really oversell this. Uh, the printing press is one of the most significant intellectual achievements uh, for mankind in terms of its actual uh, profound effect. Uh, uh, Gutenberg uh, developed the printing press in 1440. This is picture is actually a Gutenberg press. So we're getting uh, late enough that we have some actual items there. Now, prior to the printing press, all copying had to be done by hand. And not only that, writing materials were even hard to make and to come by. So it was very difficult to, to uh, make copies of things. So as we've discussed before, many times things that were uh, not deemed as important just didn't get copied and they got lost because uh, it was just too much work to do that. And, and even things that were very important, there were not that many copies around. There could errors come into the copying process and so forth. So there are a lot of problems there. So about the time the printing press came about, there was also a cheap source of paper that was uh, developed. So that combination of the paper and the printing press itself made for a, a, a vast technological revolution. And it gra greatly influenced the ability to mass produce and disseminate information. So now one could uh, write a, a, a one-page broadsheet or, or could write a small book or a paper and then reproduce that en masse and get copies out to many people. People could reproduce earlier works and uh, actually typeset them and, and you know perhaps translate them into different languages and get them printed. So in mathematics, uh, Euclid's Elements was among the earliest works printed. Uh, Europe never really lost some copies of Euclid's elements, but uh, they were, you know, maybe few and far between. Whereas now we had copies of Euclid's elements, perhaps in the original Greek, perhaps in other translations, that were now uh, disseminated much more widely in Europe. Islamic algebraic works were actually among the first to be most influential while science and literature turned to the classical Greek works for inspiration, mathematics and the early Renaissance started with a more focus on the late medieval European advances and Islamic advances in arithmetic and algebra. Partly because the, the higher level Greek mathematics was just harder and uh, they didn't have the ability to uh, really understand that just at first. So they latched on to the Islamic advances in arithmetic and algebra, which they could understand a little bit better. And then, then as time went on, they developed uh, some more uh, interest in an in expansion of some of the more advanced classical Greek mathematics. But that came a little bit later, uh, later in the Renaissance. So what were some of the mathematical advances in the Renaissance? Well, certainly they printed and distributed earlier works from Greek and Islamic mathematics. So now these things are much more available in, in Europe. Uh, they became more um, translated into the various different local languages as well as um, working in Latin. Latin sort of became the uh, main language for academics but they were works were translated into local languages as well. Universities taught more mathematics. Hindu Arabic numerals with pen and paper computational techniques became the standard. So at this point, uh, sometime in the Renaissance uh, is when Hindu Arabic numerals finally came into their own in Europe, even though they'd been introduced uh, much earlier uh, in the works of Fibonacci, for example, in the middle ages, among others. Uh, they made a lot of advances in algebra, including solving cubic and quartic equations. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit in one of our videos here. They gradually introduced some symbolism for operations and variables. 
So algebra is starting to look a little bit like algebra looks today. Before that, algebra was all done with words. Mathematical treatments of perspective ended up transforming visual arts, making it more realistic and simulating three dimensions. So there was an explosion in the visual arts as well. And uh, mathematics had something to do with that as well. There was increased experimentation in science. Trigonometry uh, was more defined and advanced, and advanced as a standalone field independent of astronomy. Uh, there was initial interest in the more basic parts of geom Greek geometry, but gradual interest in, uh, was increased in more advanced geometry, such as conics, as mathematicians became advanced enough to understand and expand this work, and as the more advanced works became available in print and in translations. So there's, there's a quick overview of some of the mathematics in the Renaissance. In the next few videos, we're going to look a little bit more in-depth at certain parts of this.